few weeks ago, I tested GPT-4 for chemistry and it sucks on its own. The key phrase is on its own. Enter ChemCrow. Here's an overview of how it all works. ChemCrow is in the middle, which is a combination of a large language model, which would be GPT-4 in this case, but this could be any large language model like Llama from Meta or any open source language model in the future. And LangChain, which is a large language model application framework. And what ChemCrow does is it combines user input and tasks that you give it to. So this would be the prompts that you would give to GPT alone normally. And it combines this user input with tools. So let's look at the tools in figure two. They split the tools in three categories, general tools, molecule tools, and reaction tools. So general tools are web search and literature search. So web search would be your Google search and literature search is searching from um, publications. That's actually pretty sophisticated. I really like what they did there. They summarized the papers into the most important um, parts and then they use that as part of the prompt for the large language model. Molecule tools are super important because without it, I found GPT-4 is really lost, particularly converting chemical structures into smiles, which is the format that computers use when they work with chemical structures. Then obtain price of molecule, that's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, third one is molecule to CAS. So CAS is a unique identification number for uh, chemical compounds. That's very useful if you're doing other searches. Molecule similarity, molecule modification, they can do patent check and also look at functional groups. The reaction tools are probably the most complicated. They have reaction classification tool, reaction prediction tool, and synthesis planning. Some of these are proprietary and they explain everything really nicely in the method section. Once the large language model is integrated with the tools, you can go into this uh, working cycle of the ChemCrow. And I'll explain this on a particular example so it's uh, easier to understand. Here's the overall task that we're trying to accomplish. I need to synthesize a sample of atorvastatin, which is Lipitor. Please tell me how to synthesize it. Tell me how much it will cost to buy all the reactants I need. Provide specific substance names um, or smiles. If you can determine the price of the reactants, try another synthetic route. So we gave it the user input. We want to synthesize atorvastatin. And then ChemCrow goes into this uh, working loop. So the first thought is right here. First, I need to find smiles for atorvastatin to plan a synthetic route. So that's the thought. The action is to select a tool. Action input is atorvastatin, which is the name of the molecule. Um, it goes into the tool, so it selects the tool. It needs to get the smiles. So query to smiles, there's multiple tools how you can get the smiles. If it fails on the first one, it goes to the second one and third one. And then the observation is, which is the action output, it gives you the smiles for atorvastatin, which is Lipitor. Thought, now that you have a smiles of atorvastatin, plan a synthetic route. So that's the observations from the first task. We got the smiles for the molecule, and now you can keep going through the cycle. The next thought is action molecular synthesis planner goes uh, into the action, selects a tool. Uh, it needs to find the right tool. So that would be react in the reaction tools. Uh, it would be synthesis planning, pulls up the correct tool. And then this tool gives you the proposed synthesis of atorvastatin from these reagents. So it gives you add uh, 0.7 millimoles of this compound, then add uh, dichromethane and keeps going through multiple steps. And then at the end, it gives you smiles of the uh, new molecule. And here's the overall result for the task. So the target was atorvastatin. And uh, here in this uh, rectangle, we have the attempt by GPT-4. So GPT-4 does give you a lot of different structures and a lot of different reactions that it's uh, trying to propose, but uh, a lot of times these are not correct. Uh, on the other hand, here is ChemCrow. Uh, it gave you this molecule and then it gives you um, several steps on how to get to the final product. And here's the important part, the human evaluation. So they took a chemist and they looked at the, the output from GPT-4 and ChemCrow. For, for GPT-4 in this particular case, poor planning, no awareness of the current progress. I also found that when I was testing myself, it just gets stuck. It uh, just gives you gibberish. It hallucinates all the time. From step three, the reactions do not make any sense. And I did find this uh, even just trying to get the smiles of different molecules. It would give you different structures every time and they were no, pretty much never right unless they were really simple like aspirin the human evaluator also said it does not lead to the product so the average grade they gave it was 1.5 and for chemcrow they said although this is not a total synthesis which makes sense because uh this is already a pretty complex structure as a precursor for each step it provides action including quantities times and conditions. So they gave for this particular case uh, a grade of 10 out of 10. I think that they picked the best example because you will see in the next uh, figure, it did not always do as well. And here are the results. So what they did, they tested ChemCrow and GPT on uh, 12 different chemistry tasks. And for each of these tasks, they used human evaluators to evaluate 
how good is the response accuracy and completion of the task. In the purple, we have ChemCrow, and in yellow, we have GPT-4. Uh, so they did the evaluation by humans. So that's uh, this figure right here and this figure right here. And they also use GPT-4 in a teacher evaluation. So GPT-4 evaluated the output from itself and also from ChemCrow. And you can see the evaluation from GPT-4 is a lot more generous than the evaluation from humans. So this is a really important uh, point because GPT-4 is not good evaluating its own output. And I also found that in lots of different testing. Even if you use it for coding, uh, it spits out a lot of code, but a lot of times it's buggy and it has a hard time uh, figuring out where are the bugs and how good the code will perform. And this figure in the bottom right corner is just the average of these three figures. So the GPT-4 evaluator, it gave a really high score for both uh, ChemCrow and GPT-4. And for human evaluation, you can see that ChemCrow is significantly better than GPT-4 alone, uh, particularly for accuracy, also for completion of tasks. I think this work can potentially be very powerful and the authors are aware of it and there are risks associated with this. So first is the dual usage risk. So that would be the usage for positive and negative purposes. So you can see that if this works really well, if uh, they improve the large language models and we integrate even more tools and kind of fine tune the tools for chemistry applications, it can really accelerate how fast people can do tasks. But it can also be used for negative purposes as they point out right here, for example, for designing drugs or even designing chemical weapons. So that's kind of the really obvious risk of this, that anytime you build something really powerful, it can be used maliciously um, with malicious intent. Other un uh, risk is the unintended risk. So the issue with um, models like these, ChemCrow, is that it gives power to people who might not be aware of this power. So let's say you have somebody who's like a new student and you give them ChemCrow, full access to ChemCrow, they might start doing uh, experiments on their own and they might not fully understand the potential risks. So maybe ChemCrow by accident gives you some uh, dangerous reaction that could explode or can lead to some toxic product. And you might not be aware of the safety implications and this could result in potential harm. The limitation section is surprisingly short in this paper. Uh, and I think the biggest limitation which they correctly identify is that GPT-4 or large language models general will pretty much always give you an answer and you have no idea how accurate the answer is. And um, that I think is the problem because a lot of people are using GPT-4 to test things. So for example, I'm making a lot of videos about GPT-4 where I use it to code and I ask questions of GPT-4 of topics that I'm highly familiar with. So I know when GPT-4 gives me the wrong answer, I'm like, well, that's obviously wrong. But the problem is that as uh, people start trusting these large languages more and more and more, and they always spell out the answer, you have no idea if it's correct or incorrect. And that is probably the biggest limitation of large language models currently. It's really hard to figure out the confidence of the output. If you ask a person, like a normal chemist, to uh, give you a proposed synthesis, and then you ask them, well, how sure you are that this is gonna work, they'll probably give you a really good estimate of how sure they are. But GPT-4 would be like, yeah, that'll work, and it could be completely wrong. So because of this uh, risk that it could uh, create hazardous substances or it could be used for malicious purposes, uh, ChemCrow is not currently uh, open to the public. But what is interesting that they did a really good job of describing what they did. So they integrated a large range model, which is available to the public. You can get GPT-4 currently, but you can get an API for chat GPT and you can get some other open source models. Then you can integrate with Langchain, which there's a lot of tutorials on YouTube on how to do this. And then you can uh, integrate Langchain with uh, all these APIs of all these different chemistry tools. And if you don't know all these chemistry tools, you just go to the methods of this paper. And in the method section, it tells you exactly what they did. So they implemented for the query to smiles, they implemented with uh, uh, ChemSpace right here. And then if that didn't work, they implemented with PopChem. And even if that didn't work, they implemented with uh, Smiles Converter Opsin. And it gives you references for all of these. And the same for Optane Price, they integrate with the Zinc database, Molecule for Cats. And so they give you all the different steps you need. So if you have a reasonably capable software engineer, they should be able to replicate pretty much exactly what they did in the paper. In the ChemCrow uh, model, the large language model pretty much acts like a human because when you hire a junior chemist, they don't know all these things. What they do is uh, they use their brain to kind of make a plan and they use tools to uh, execute the small tasks that they came up with. That's exactly what large language models do and that's why they are so powerful. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next video.